Well, today we had the oral arguments for the Flynn case, uh, at least where we're at right now with it. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but I've got a few other things, too, that I want to cover. So stick with me, folks. I'll be right back. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about Flynn in just a minute, but I've got a few things up front I want to cover first just to get us into it. And to start out with, I want to show you this tweet. For those of you who might remember the Seinfeld show, this was a segment right here that was talking about Kramer. He wanted to walk for AIDS, but they wanted him to wear a little ribbon, and he didn't want to wear the ribbon. And what happened to him is pretty much what's happening to people now if, if you try to say all lives matter instead of just black lives matter. So, yeah, they attacked him at the end and everything. I'm not going to play it, but uh, if you want to see it, you can watch it here. And this person took it and added a few subtitles that I think are pretty apropos for what we're seeing happen now. So, anyway, I just wanted to show you that and give you the link. I'll put all the links down below. Just like usual, there's going to be a lot of them, so hang in there. <laughs> and then, I just thought this was too funny here. Carpe Donctum does a good job and said, My favorite part about 2020 so far is when the anti-fascists took over part of a town to create a utopia free from the tyranny of Donald Trump and then immediately built a wall around it, started extorting businesses, and created a police force that assaults people. I don't know if you've been watching the Tucker Carlson um, segments that he's been doing on this, but, oh, they're just too funny and you know the whole thing is these people if you look at their demands they have like this liberal wish list of demands and one of them is open borders but yet they've got a border and they just reinforced it because they found out people were going over it and through it that they didn't know who they were and like they're checking ids and there are some people with weapons in there that I'm not sure I'd want protecting me and I'd be more scared of than being protected. So it, it really is turning into quite a, a thing. And of course, the liberal media is downplaying it and saying, oh, it's just a big love fest. Yeah. Uh-huh. So if you haven't seen Tucker's stuff, you need to see that because the segments he's doing are great. Well, I wanted to show you this because I think this is just so eye-opening. And evidently, this at Kirpin has been doing incredible work covering coronavirus nursing home deaths by state. The numbers are just staggering. 52% of all New Jersey deaths come from nursing homes. 5,466 lives lost represent 12% of, of all nursing home residents in the state. And then there's this Google Doc that if you go to it, I mean, it's got them all. And here's the column you really have to pay attention to because, okay, this is the number of COVID deaths in the nursing homes. The LTC is the nursing homes. Okay. And then state deaths on the date that they're having it. And over here's the date. So then you can see how many the state had as of that date. I think it's as of. And then the total deaths minus the LTC deaths, which then you can see what percent of this number, the total, was this number. And this one, you know, 51.3% there in Alabama. And you go down, I mean, these numbers are pretty staggering here. Indiana has, uh, let's see right here. 47.4%. I mean, a lot of them. Look at this one. 72. Connecticut had 72.3% of their deaths were in nursing homes. Um, just kind of scary. Here's 63% in Idaho. And some of them, it says over here, bad data. So um, don't know about those. This one's 79.7% .7 in Minnesota. Um just some staggering numbers. 82.5% on for New Hampshire. 74.3% um, for North Dakota. Ohio's 71%. Down here, Pennsylvania, 69%. This one, Rhode Island, is 79.8%. So when you start looking at these, it really does... 
uh, open your eyes to what's going on. And so I'll leave the link to this. Well, I'll leave the link to this one down below. And that has the link to the um, spreadsheet. Uh, so then let's get to the main event because we might as well get it out of the way. I've got a few more things at the end to show you. But yep, this is what happened today. And uh, the D.C. Court of Appeals heard the oral arguments from Judge Emmett Sullivan's lawyer, which is so bizarre. You've got a judge that has a lawyer. That just seems odd to me. And Sidney Powell and also... Um, oh, I can't remember his first name. Wall is his last name. He was the one to, he's the deputy solicitor general, I believe. He's not the solicitor general. That's Noel Francisco. I did a video on him once, and, but he's like the deputy and he did a great job. He really did. So this was where, this is the link to where you can see it on YouTube. So if you want to see it, and yeah, they were anticipating a very large number of people wanted to hear it. Well, there have been a large number of people. So far on this, 121,000 have uh, viewed it. So kind of interesting there. And um, when you go through it and listen to this, I want to tell you just a few things if you haven't heard it already. And if you're not used to hearing the oral arguments like from the Supreme Court and stuff, when they're asking the questions, the judges, there's th a panel of three judges. Let me show you them first. Here, uh, Naomi Rao, that was one, and she was appointed by Trump, okay? And she was preceded by Brett Kavanaugh for this particular position. So, you know, she's pretty solid, and she's the young one that you'll hear talking, the young female. And then there's an older female, and her name is Karen L. Henderson. She was appointed by Bush, and she was preceded by Ken Starr. So um, she's fairly solid, too. This guy was an Obama appointee, Robert Wilkins, and pretty easy to figure out which one's him because he's the only male voice, <laughs> you know, well, from the judges. And yeah, he just, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let me go back to this because I have opinions on him. And I'll tell you what, I didn't even have to know which ones were which, who was appointed by whom to figure this out because the questions made it kind of obvious. Anyway, uh, the first, oh gosh, two thirds of this was taken up. The first one third was taken up by Sidney Powell. The second third was... Oh, I should have looked up his name, Wall, <laughs> the Deputy Solicitor General Wall. And um, then the last third was taken up by Judge Emmett Sullivan's lawyer. OK, and when they're doing this, OK, I've listened to some of the Supreme Court uh, arg oral arguments and don't be offended at first when they come out asking questions that seem very harsh. OK, the judges purposely ask questions. They want to get to the truth. They're not going to show bias. So there's going to be some pretty tough questions. And Sidney Paul had to answer some pretty tough questions. And so did Deputy Solicitor General. But um, they did a good job. They did an excellent job. One of the most bizarre moments was when the deputy solicitor general was talking and he was making his case uh, and the Wilkins guy, you know, this Obama guy right here, he was interested to find out if the uh, DOJ should be telling more reasons why they think Flynn's case should be dismissed. And so this guy gives a totally hypothetical situation case and whatever and he said something about like a white cop attacks a black person and it's like what does this have to do with the Flynn case and he was wondering would it be ethical for them to hide you know for the DOJ to hide why they were dismissing the case but it was just because they thought they couldn't really prosecute it it's like, no, this has nothing to do with Flynn. It has nothing at all. But he kept using that example all the way through. So it was pretty obvious he was an Obama person. And it's just like, that has, why? Why would you bring that up? 
I don't know whether he is or not, but I don't think he's black. Um, it didn't really say in his bio or anything, so I don't know for sure, and it didn't have a picture of him, but it just seemed really, really odd. So at the first, the first two-thirds of it, they're asking questions that make it seem like they're going to rule against this writ of mandamus that uh, Sidney Powell put in. That's not necessarily true. I'm not sure that's what's going to happen. The biggest thing that I think from my impression of it was that they believe that they should wait until after this upcoming, I think it's June 16th, that Sullivan had set up for um, going through this and hearing from them, asking some questions and hearing from the Sidney Powell and everything. Because they said, well, you know, he might just go ahead and dismiss it. And so you're kind of jumping the gun. Well, the deputy is the Deputy Solicitor General, his argument was it is very probable that this is going to be used to continue this and drag it out forever and ever. Amen. Well, the, the judges didn't sound convinced, but again, you can't always tell. I mean, I've done that on Supreme Court things where I was positive that people were going to rule one way or the other just from their questions, and then they surprised me and ruled a different way. So you can't necessarily tell, but I wanted to let you listen to just this little part here. This is going to be this lady and the lawyer for Emmett Sullivan. So that's what you're going to hear. Court was clear that there is a presumption, so it is a long hill to climb to overcome that presumption. But there's nothing in Fokker that says you may not question the government. And in fact, the government answers these kinds of questions all the time. If you look at Rinaldi, then Chief Judge King of the Southern District of Florida's court, called the prosecutors in and asked questions. The Supreme Court in Rinaldi didn't say that kind of questioning was improper. That happens every day in district courts when a party files a motion, and a judge asks questions. That's all that's happening here. There's well, nothing about, more, nothing less. Oh, I mean, there is more here. There's an appointment of an amicus to oppose the motion to dismiss. I mean, that is, that I don't believe is an, or, um, you know, everyday occurrence. You're absolutely right, Your Honor, because uh, normally parties are opposed. But here in this unusual circumstance where both parties agree, all the district court did was appoint an amicus to present arguments in opposition to the government's motion to dismiss. And we, we know, because at least some time has passed, that the amicus filed that brief and did not ask for any witnesses, did not request any fact-finding. So uh, to go to Judge Henderson's point about the regular order, if this court doesn't step into the fray and allows the district court to do its job, it may well be that the court reads both sides, both briefings, asks the government's question, and grants the motion to dismiss. Who is the amicus representing here? I mean, what is the, I mean, you know, where the government decided to drop a prosecution and the defendant agrees, like, what is the standard that they're arguing? I mean, who are they arguing on behalf of? They're arguing on behalf of the adversarial position, just like this court does often or the Supreme Court does. I mean, one of the most famous cases is Dickerson, where the, the government was not going to challenge the Miranda standard, and the court appointed an amicus there to argue because the government chose not to take that position. Right, but so what is the... So you're saying that there's some kind of judicial right or judicial power here that the amicus is representing? No, I think, I mean, I think as uh, Mr. Wall stated, there's an inherent power and it occurs at the district court level, not frequently, for the court to appoint an amicus uh, when it needs advice or legal briefing on an issue. But here it's even more important because there's, you need adversarial briefing. See, this is what she was going through. That was her case all the way through, pretty much, that somehow Emmett Sullivan needed to hear the other side of the story better, even though that's what he should have heard from the prosecutors to begin with. 
it just it made no sense and when you heard the uh judge rao asking her well who exactly are they representing i mean there's no need for it so i think rao will probably vote to uh go with it now henderson the other lady uh she was more of a person who um wanted to keep things regular and follow the regular pattern of the court, which meant that uh, they would wait until Sullivan made a decision on the 16th. So, hmm, I don't know. I hate to have that happen because you know he's not going to dismiss it. It's just not going to happen. He has no legal standing not to dismiss it. He needs to dismiss it. He should, according to the law, dismiss it. But I don't think that's what's going to happen because I think they're desperate to keep that gag order on Flynn. And this rigmarole, that's what it's all about. This is an article by Jonathan Turley on it. And he just talks about Gleason, who was the guy who was filing the amicus brief for Judge Sullivan against Michael Flynn, against the dismissal. And he says, however, Gleason is not striking an independent or principled position. Rather, he is suggesting that the court simply treat Flynn as a perjurer, punish him as a perjurer, but not give him a trial as a perjurer. So uh, that's pretty much what's going on. And that's what this Gleason guy has been doing because they just want to get Flynn and it hasn't ended and it's very obvious. And that's what Wall was trying to say. He kept saying, you know, this is going to cause real problems. And it's actually an injury that it's going to cause to the executive branch. And so it's just wrong. But um, the judges were did not sound convinced. Now, again, I'm not saying they weren't. They may rule that way. But you just don't know at this point. How did it go? I think Sydney did an awesome job. I think Wall did a great job. I think uh, there was absolutely no real case from uh, Sullivan's lawyer. She just kept saying, well, do we just need to go ahead and do it? Because, you know, we're not saying that he won't judge that it will be dismissed anyway. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I don't believe that for one minute, because if that's the truth, honey, why are you even there? See, there was no reason for this whole thing with the Gleason amicus brief and this lawyer there. They were unnecessary if Solomon is likely to dismiss the case anyway. So um, I just think it's a setup again. But, you know, what do you expect? Well, this is an op ed on the Western Journal from General Flynn. So he's, uh, it's not that he's, um, he can't talk about anything having to do with this case, but this is a very good little article that I think you need to hear. There are seminal moments in American history that test every fiber of our nation's soul. We are facing one now. Revolutionary forces are causing every American citizen to question which direction the country is heading. To determine the outcome, we must examine our nation's history to project ourselves forward into the future. Once again, tyranny and treachery are in our midst. And although we feel we've descended into a hellish state of existence, we must never forget hell is conquerable. Prayer is the greatest weapon, and a consciousness of God is the ultimate thought of the day. The idea or notion of a heaven on earth is the very real sense of being free. Freedom is oxygen, like the air we breathe that keeps our lungs full and our hearts beating. The celestial feeling of freedom brings a sense of peace to our souls. Freedom must never be taken for granted. Securing our freedom demands a high price, and that price requires hard work and sacrifice. Both will bind us all by the value they produce, but only if we are willing to seek new opportunities and new ideas. Those who have sacrificed the most, those who have given the last true measure of devotion that derives from the love of faith, family, and the cause of freedom, for all of us to be free and for the betterment of our republic and the free world, cannot be allowed to have died in vain. 
Theirs is the ultimate sacrifice, and heaven is their reward. Our future, the future of our children and grandchildren, and the future of our country are at stake. God will not give way to the care of the devil, or allow us to be left to the evil vices of those who would steal our freedom in the dark of night. He will not. Instead, God will stand with us, as he always does. Hard work and personal sacrifice still very much matter. Being a good person and showing kindness to others still matter. If our nation is to survive this crucible moment, we need to fall back on the God-given values and ideals that are the very foundation of our constitutional republic. Let us not fear the uncertainty that comes with the unknown. Instead, accept it and fight through that sense of fear. And we must remember the power of hell, while strong, is limited. God is the ultimate judge and decision maker. His anointed providence is our country, the United States of America. As long as we accept God in the lifeblood of our nation, we will be okay. If we don't, we will face a hellish existence. I vote we accept God. Hey, I do too. I vote for that. And this came out on the 11th. So, um... I'll leave the link to it below if you want to watch it. This video is just actually, it, it doesn't have him speaking. It just plays the titles with uh, what we just read. So um, anyway, yeah, on the 11th is when it came out. But really good there. I agree with him. And then this is just a quick summary from X-22 report. General Flynn case. Sidney Powell, DOJ wants to dismiss. DOJ, we have no case. We want to dismiss. United States Appeals Court, we hear you, but we have instructions not to dismiss, so we are going to drag this out. And then, four, where is that original 302? So, I'm not sure they're going to actually vote to drag it out, but it was kind of sounding like that. So, I think what they were wanting to do is just wait until after the decision, whatever decision Judge Sullivan makes, on the 16th, so... Oh, I'm just so glad I'm not General Flynn, but, you know, pray for him all the time because it's just wearing on you. Then, um, this is an article from the Epic Times. You'll have to have a subscription to it if you uh, want to read the whole article. But this guy says, I wanted to do a list of the, all the lies, contradictions, strange coincidences, and unusual happenings in the General Flynn case. I thought there will be maybe 30. So far, I've 85. And that doesn't count in the court docs from yesterday. So uh, it's a very interesting article. There are several of them. Um, and you just go from one to the other. There's a lot of odd things that happened, a lot of weird coincidences, contradictions, everything. So I'll leave the link to this again down below and you can read it. You can read the first couple paragraphs, but again, if you don't have an Epic Times subscription, you won't be able to read the rest. But why don't you have an Epic Times subscription? It's really good, okay? So, I highly recommend it. Then, I, this is just for fun. I wanted to show you this. Guess what? Mike Pompeo has a new dog named Mercer. Little puppy. Isn't it cute? I mean, he's got all these pictures. Look at that little sweetie. Oh, everybody needs to look at a cute little dog once in a while. Hey, Mike, you want me to walk your dog? I'd walk that little cutie. Definitely. And he said she's named after General Hugh Mercer, who fought in the Revolutionary War and was a close friend of George Washington. Also, my mother's maiden name. <laughs> so uh, he had a couple of interesting things. Um, you know, he, his first retriever was named Patton. This is his personal feed here. And, he, you know, his son Nick completed his MBA at Cornell and uh, he puts up Bible verses every so often. But here's his other dog. So, yeah, there's the Mercer and the other dog. So that, that was just fun. Oh, he also had a, an anniversary, 20-year anniversary. So I thought that was nice, too. So anyway, I thought those just might be kind of nice to hear. Well, this one is about what's going on in Seattle. And by now, you probably all have heard of Chaz in Seattle. And we talked about it, you know, just a little earlier. But this is, they have this post up for things that they need. These are the items that they need. And it's, this person says, most people would have CPS called on them for less. Where are the children sleeping? 
Do they have proper food? Do they have running water for baths and to brush their teeth? Where on this selfish list are there items for kids? And it's, it's true. I mean, there are little kids that are there. See, there's some little kids. They are there. And you got to wonder well, how they're being taken care of. It's just a little scary. And then, oh, I got to tell you this, because on the Tucker, the, the one from tonight for Tucker, uh, I'm recording this on Friday night. So you got to make sure you go watch it because they were talking about it and they had a garden. Okay. <laughs> it was a garden. Oh, now for those who don't know, I have another channel called Garden Devotions that I do a few things on. But it was like I do container gardening. And so I talk about gardens and devotions and stuff like that on there. And so for me, I, you know, I know what it takes to make a garden. And they had pretty much a patch of dirt. And they had a few straggly little plants grow. You know how long it takes to grow plants? You know how many plants you'd have to have to feed the number of people that they have in this chaz right now? I mean, there's just no way. And yeah, that's how they're going to provide for the food. And I tell you what, they're not going to be there that long. Okay. Radishes take at least three days just for them to come up. So, you know, there's no way. Yeah. Even microgreens, they're not going to be there long enough to eat microgreens because if this doesn't stop soon, Trump's going to step in and he should because essentially these people are rebelling against our country. They want to secede from our country and they have their enemy combatants at this point because they have created their own little country and uh, it's it's a little scary. But anyway, so I thought this was a good point, you know, saying that that's what is going on and, you know, what is happening with the kids. Then I want to update you a little bit about Brandon Straka because I had something about him in the last video that he was supposed to do a commencement speech, a virtual commencement speech, and he had it all done up and everything, and they wouldn't let him give it because he had part of it in there where, you know, cause it's a video that he did and he had a place in there where he was shaking Donald Trump's hand and that he had Fox news around there and you know, they didn't want those and they refused. And so he said, people are asking the name of the school. Cause some of you asked that in the comments, he said, I promised the head of the school. I would not say it publicly at this point because he's been supporting me in this. It's members of his staff that are protesting. I don't want to cause trouble for the school. I just want people to know this story. And then he said, I was just informed by the head of the school that a faculty member has resigned over my speech. I just, you know, cannot imagine. Today I met with faculty of this college to defend my use of imagery of me meeting Donald Trump and me on Fox News in my commencement speech video, which they requested I remove. I told them I will not. Head of school informed me he will use the video. A teacher has resigned over it. I mean, serious, this is just so crazy. And uh, he says, I was planning to put the commencement speech video out this evening. Everything went sideways today. And he says, see story and tweets below. Tomorrow I will go live to explain the situation and I'll put the commencement video out tomorrow. I promise. I, I apologize to those who have been waiting. And he did, he says, oh, this I think is really great. Uh, I brought it up a little bigger here. Walk away is absolutely spiking in membership right now. And we have so many amazing testimonials coming in every day. And from so many people, my heart is bursting. Please join our group and see these incredible stories. And for those who might not know, I don't know if there's any of you, but because, you know, my viewers are really smart people. And so uh, Walk Away is a movement that he started where people were walking away from the Democrat Party because they were discovering that the Democrat Party wasn't all it was trying to make people believe it was. And that essentially they cared more about votes and about power than they cared about people. And they found out that all the things they'd been hearing, all the evil things about the evil Republican Party, you know, all of those things they'd been hearing for years, they found out they weren't true. 
So a lot of people are walking away from the Democrat Party. And so I think this is exciting to hear that it's absolutely spiking in membership right now. I think that's great. So his, uh, he did put the video out. Uh, where is it? It's on here somewhere. Uh, this one was a video testimonial. Democrats have always had it out for black folks. So I thought that was a really good one. And then, uh, na, 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 na. Um, yeah, another statue being taken down. So, some, oh, here's the, the speech. So this was the commencement speech. And I haven't had a chance to watch it because I was listening to the General Flynn hearing stuff. And just, there's been so much in the last few days. So uh, this, you can watch it here. I probably will watch it tomorrow sometime, but I just haven't had time yet. And then uh, you know that uh, Mattis has come out and he's talking about uh, President Trump in very negative terms. Well, just take a look at that picture and need I say more? Uh, this is a really good thread. Actually, I will leave this for you um, because there, it goes through some different things that I think you might want to find out. So I'll leave the link to that down below. And then I got to play you this because Joe you know the rapidly rising uh, um, uh, in with uh, with uh, I don't know uh, uh. yeah that's the man we want to have for president right <laughs> oh my goodness it's 10 seconds long and it's totally incoherent for 10 seconds so can you imagine him on stage with President Trump in a debate? Oh, Trump will mop the floor with him. And that was from Richard Grinnell. And then the last thing I want to end with is this. This was a meeting that President Trump had today with some of the African-American radio personalities. And uh, I just thought it was very interesting, well worth watching. And he had one yesterday. Well, it'll be the 11th. And... Um, it had to do with uh, some of the other, some of the religious leaders. That one was excellent as well. So it just amazes me. He gets along so well with them. But I wanted you to hear this. My name is Raynard Jackson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Daryl, for inviting us to this round table here. I'm from St. Louis originally, live here in, in Virginia. But what I'd like to say to you, Mr. President, is kind of off the beaten path. I'd like to say to all the media assembled here that I wish they would quit lying about what you've done specifically for the black community. So you got radical liberal journalists like Joy Reid from MSNBC, Don Lemon from CNN, Roland Martin, who are putting more poison into the black community than any drug dealer, who are killing more black folks than any white person with a seat over their face. How are they doing it? Spreading these lies about the economy you had, Mr. President, before the virus was a continuation of Obama. That's just factually not true. I have a degree in accounting. I keep up with the economy. They're lying. So to all these folks on MSNBC, CNN, Roland Martin, were well, you afraid to have real black Republicans who know what the hell they're talking about? If you want to know the truth, if you want us to dissect the Obama economy, let's do it. And I think, Mr. President, your record would win the debate. Thank you. That was great, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, man. He nailed it. I just thought that was was well worth seeing, right? So anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by, and I'll see you all later. Bye.